Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Deadly blast rips through crowded Herat Mosque. Indian security forces eliminate two Hezbollah terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir. And Pakistan's terror net gets exposed again. Afghanistan has been marred with isolated attacks taking place across the length and breadth of the country, particularly after the Taliban stormed to power in August last year. Since then, disparate militia groups in their bid to exert their dominance have launched attacks. In the latest, a huge blast rocks one of the biggest mosques in Afghanistan's western city of Herat, killing at least 18 and injuring some 23 people. A massive explosion ripped through a mosque in Afghanistan, left at least 18 dead. The blast took place during the Friday prayers in the biggest mosque in western city of Herat. A leading pro-Taliban cleric, Mujib Rahman Ansari, is among 18 people killed in the blast. According to police, Ansari was arriving at Gazargah Mosque to lead Friday noon prayers when a suicide bomber kissed the cleric's hand and detonated an explosive device. Unverified images on social media appear to show a number of bloody eight corpses lying amid a scene of devastation outside the mosque compound in the western Afghan city. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack, but the Islamic State group has previously issued videos threatening the pro-Taliban cleric. خطیب سر از این مسیر طرف مسجد می رفتم ناگان به من جی که رسیدم یکی از خدا ناتر سی ازی بر بیام آد که من مسایفه می کنم خطیب خطیب سر مانه شدیم و خطیب سر گفتم بگذاریم بیا وقتی که پیش آماد از پشت سر کور بغل زد یکی از وظیفین خطیب سر دید که مشکوک و کش کرد انفجار کرد Meanwhile Islamic State Group targeted the Russian embassy in Kabul At least eight people got killed in the suicide bombing According to sources, the bomber detonated the explosives near the entrance of the building in the southwestern part of the capital. Two members of the embassy staff are among the dead, and as many as 15 others were injured. Today, three hours ago, there was a terrorist act. Неизвестный боевик привел в действие взрывное устройство в непосредственной близости от входа в консульский отдел нашего посольства. Погибли два наших товарища и незамедлительно был предпринят комплекс мер по усилению охраны внешнего периметра. Привлечены дополнительные силы талибских властей, задействованы возможности службы разведки и контрразведки Афганистана. Будем надеяться на то, что устроители этого террористического акта и его исполнители понесут заслуженные наказания в самое ближайшее время. Сейчас я предлагаю почтить память наших товарищей минуты молча. Islamic State has emerged as the most potent enemy of the Taliban, who seized control over Afghanistan last year. The two groups are now engaged in a murky and bloody battle. The security situation in the country, which had improved after the end of fighting following the Taliban takeover, is seen to be deteriorating. On one hand, Afghanistan faces an endless threat of terrorism. On the other hand, the country finds itself gripped by the severe restrictions imposed by the Taliban. The hardliners deprived millions of Afghan women of their right to education, ousted tens of thousands of women from jobs, and banned women's businesses and all sorts of activism. Not only are the women in Afghanistan suffering, but more than 90% of Afghans have been facing a shortage of food. Afghanistan is now facing 
one of the world's worst humanitarian crises. The Afghan economy has no cash to pay salaries or buy food. Western aid has been suspended because the Taliban government includes designated terrorists. Millions of Afghans face acute malnutrition and starvation. The Taliban lack capacity to manage these monumental challenges, but there is no clear alternative to their rule. Frustrated by its failures at fomenting trouble in India, Pakistan is using all tricks in its book to unleash violence in the country. But vigilant Indian security forces have been successfully throwing all its mischievous agendas. In the latest, security forces in Jammu and Kashmir neutralized two Hezbollah Mujahideen terrorists in the Anantanag district. As per police reports, both the slain ultras were active since 2019 and were involved in several civilian killings. A report. The Indian security forces are carrying out a series of operations to uproot the network of terrorism from Jammu and Kashmir. Recently, Terror groups operating in the valley received a huge setback when two terrorists, namely Danish Ahmed Bhatt and Basharat Nabi Lone, belonging to Hezbollah Mujahideen, were recently eliminated in Kashmir's Anantanag district. Acting on a piece of specific information regarding the presence of terrorists in the Poshridi area of Anantanag, Jammu and Kashmir police and security forces launched a joint cordon and search operation in the area. During the search operation, as the joint search party approached towards the suspected spot, the hiding terrorists fired indiscriminately upon the joint search party, which was retaliated effectively, leading to an encounter. According to police officials, both terrorists were active since the year 2019. They had a history of terror crime cases, including attacks on security forces and civilian atrocities. Incriminating materials, arms and ammunition including AK-56 rifle, 35 AK rounds, 2 AK magazines, 1 pistol, 1 pistol magazine and 2 pistol rounds were recovered from the site of the encounter. We have done much better than what we were earlier. When it was a state under a political party or under some political parties which were favoring these terrorists, that time it was difficult for the security forces to operate uh, very authentically and emphatically. Now it is relatively easier. This does not mean that no terrorist can sneak in uh, because it is a thick jungle terrain, Somebody, anybody can, can get in and then there are unemployed youth. Uh, somebody, if somebody is told that, okay, you take this money and go and throw a grenade somewhere, he will do it. Uh, so, uh, the lurement is always there. But then the fact is that the number of incidents have gone down. And after Balakot, uh, Touchwood, we did not had any major terror incident in the country. So, that is uh, perhaps a message has really gone. Jammu and Kashmir has witnessed a rapid development after the abrogation of Article 370. There has been a decline in terror-related incidents and cross-border infiltration since then. However, in the past few months, many terrorist groups backed by Pakistan are trying to infiltrate in the Kashmir Valley to disrupt the harmony in the region. Particularly, terror groups such as Lashkar-e Taiba and Jaish-e Mohammed have been the Pakistani establishment's preferred tool towards fighting India and Kashmir. They are hellbent on converting what is otherwise called paradise on earth into a living hell. Their motto is simple and clear, that is, to infuse fear and unpredictability among the people and also to make the Indian nation know that they exist. Pakistan will continue to follow the policy of uh, bleeding India with thousands, thousand cuts because it is normally seen, it is not only Pakistan, whenever there is an asymmetry of conventional power, so we have uh, asymmetry in the conventional forces 
and the weaker force will always try to use the non-state actors. Now that is exactly what Pakistan is doing and they will continue to do it. While Jammu and Kashmir is trying to return back to normalcy, Pakistan intensifies its efforts to create havoc in the region. The country has always sought with varying degrees of intensity to destabilize India, wreck its unity and challenge its integrity. And this approach is unlikely to change. However, the Indian security forces are fully committed to bring peace in the Kashmir Valley. As recently, there have been many operations across Jammu and Kashmir in which several terrorists have been neutralized, in which many of them were foreign nationals. Pakistan's entire history shows it has betrayed its own people. It has always been reluctant in accepting the dead bodies of terrorists who are killed by Indian security forces. Recently, Islamabad's role in promoting terrorism in India got exposed after the country accepted the body of terrorist Tabrak Hussain, who was captured by the Indian Army at line of control in Jammu and Kashmir's Rajori district. A report. Pakistan's role in promoting terrorism in India got exposed after the country accepted the body of terrorist Tabarak Hussain, who was captured by the Indian Army at line of control in Jammu and Kashmir's Rajori district. This is probably the first instance in more than two decades that Pakistan has accepted a terrorist's body. Islamabad has a history of refusing to accept the bodies of its nationals involved in terror acts in India. Hussain, while undergoing treatment, had revealed that he had been sent along with three to four other terrorists and were paid money by a Pakistani colonel, Yunus Chaudhry, to carry out a fidain attack on Indian soldiers after crossing the LOC. Tabarak later died of cardiac arrest. Recently, Pakistan accepted the dead body of Tabarak Hussain, a terrorist who had confessed to being given rupees 30,000 by a Pakistani army colonel to carry out terrorist attacks on Indian military bases. Pakistan has accepted his dead body in a marked departure from earlier refusing to accept any such dead bodies as Pakistan now wants to give the Kashmir issue a different international dimension. Since Tabarak Hussain belonged to the Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir, now the Pakistani establishment wants to showcase this to the world that the people of POJK also want Kashmir to be amalgamated with them and thus it is a struggle of the people of POJK. In January this year, Pakistan refused to take back its slain terrorist's body after border security forces neutralized the intruder in Jammu's Arnia town. The Pakistani terrorist was neutralized in gun firing after the border security force patrol team detected suspicious movement along the barbed wire fence at the border outpost. In 2019, Pakistan had refused to accept the bodies of the five to seven Pakistani intruders who were killed by the Indian army after they had tried to infiltrate the country. During the Kargil War II, the Pakistani army had disowned soldiers and officers from the Northern Light Infantry, which had taken over Indian installations. These infantry soldiers had acted upon the orders of the Pakistani Army's top brass, General Parvez Musharraf. Despite strong evidence to the contrary, Islamabad defended its position in international forums, alleging that the infiltrators in question were Mujahideen, terrorists, not their regular army soldiers. The retrieved Pakistani military IDs and ordnance factory marked weaponry issued to the Pakistan army were shown to international agencies by the Indian government. 
The recovered personal diaries from Pakistani soldiers reveal their challenges, goals, and the severe conditions under which they were stationed. Despite this, Pakistan's government had maintained its denial that its forces were engaged. In the Kargil War and many other such instances, Pakistan has disowned its officers and soldiers who have been either caught by the Indian Army alive or they have been killed by the Indian Army. This is because Pakistan as a nation was created on the foundation of hating India. And when such news reaches the Pakistani media and the Pakistani people, it is a loss of face for the Pakistani establishment, including its army. Hence, to protect its image as a strong nation, Pakistan disowns its officers and soldiers who have been either killed or captured alive by the Indian Army. Despite glaring and incontrovertible proofs available of the Pakistani involvement in Mumbai attacks of the year 2008, the country is still not ready to concede that the terrorist attacks were masterminded by its infamous ISI and were executed by its deep jihadist state of lashkar e taiba Though a complete dossier of evidence has been periodically given to Pakistan by the Indian authorities, one irrefutable proof which emerged in the public domain was the voice transcript of the conversation which took place between the terrorists and their handlers sitting in Pakistan. Pakistan's entire history shows it has betrayed its own people. The 1970s was the deadliest decade for Bangladesh. It witnessed bloodshed and war crimes to achieve independence, which it ultimately gained. The country later lost its father of nation, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, in a brutal massacre. Recently, Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina remembered one of the darkest chapters in the history of our country on the eve of a four-day visit to India. Take a look. The proclamation of independence by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman on 27th March 1971 was a moment in history that paved the way for the liberation of Bangladesh. Today, the celebrations of Independence Day of Bangladesh remind each one of the Bangladeshis that they have lost so many dear ones to get this freedom. The liberation war in erstwhile East Pakistan was marked by the horrific genocide committed by the Pakistani army and its paramilitary force, the Razakars. The region witnessed almost a full collapse of humanity during the nine months of March to December in 1971. Around 10 million people were forced to cross border and relocate to India. According to Bangladesh Genocide Archives, 3 million people were killed, half a million girls and women were raped and entire villages were laid to waste. The abduction and subsequent rape of women by soldiers took place in camps for months. Forces of the Pakistani army targeted academics, specifically murdering many Hindu university students and professors. The goal of the operation was to crush the Bengali nationalist movement through fear. The members of Hindu community were robbed of their lands and shops, systematically slaughtered and in some places painted with yellow patches marked H. Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina remembered one of the darkest chapters in the history of her country on the eve of a four-day visit to India. In 1975, her father Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was assassinated along with her family members. As many as 18 members of her family and relatives were killed in the massacre which included her 10-year-old brother. It is said that Pakistani Army, ISI and their collaborators in Bangladesh were behind the massacre. Five decades have passed, but the pain still reflects in Hasina's voice. 15th August in the morning, we, were, we heard this news, but we couldn't believe it. It was really uh, unbelievable, unbelievable that any Bengali could do it. Hmm. And still we didn't know how, what really happened, only there was a coup. And then we heard that my father was assassinated, but we didn't know that all the family members were, you know, 
they were assassinated. But that time, Mrs. Gandhi immediately sent information. India was the only country that extended help as then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi immediately sent information and offered to provide security and shelter. Then Sheikh Hasina decided to move to Delhi in a hope that from Delhi they will be able to go back to Bangladesh and get to know how many members of her family are still alive. This crime not only killed my father, also they changed the ideology of our liberation war. Everything just, just one night, everything just changed. And those killers, they actually, they are haunting us. That they are take, trying to find out where we are. Sheikh Hasina revealed that she was once a secret resident of Delhi's posh Pandara Road, where she lived with her children under an assumed identity, trying to escape attention of those who assassinated her father. Hasina opened her piercing traumas that haunted her for decades. First two, three years, it actually, it was so difficult to accept this. My children, my, my son was only four years, old, four years old and my daughter, She's younger than him. Both of them used to cry to come go to. The Bangladeshis have been resilient in nation building and have made advances in many areas. The country has made progress in the field of education and excelled in cricket and the garment industry. Though the people still have nightmares about deadlier spirit, the country is still moving ahead. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.